Well, hello, friends. Welcome back to the program. Today, we are going to do some performance investigation, a little bit of uh, profiling, optimization, stuff like that. Uh, and I have a specific target in mind. So yesterday, we got this new um, web game running in this Render OS browser. And I mean, it's not exactly new. It's about 10 years old. But uh, there's an, an HTML canvas game called uh, Biolab Disaster uh, that you can play on playbiolab.com and uh, it's entirely web-based so like just JavaScript and HTML canvas and as you can see here it's actually playable in our browser which is really awesome although these particle effects are a little bit laggy and we're not hitting 60 FPS by any means but as you can see the game is, is definitely um, presentable. So today I thought we would uh, profile this thing and see if we can spot some interesting performance issues and maybe try to improve something. Uh, and we'll just get right into it by grabbing a profile of the running process right here. So as you can see, it's pegged at 100% CPU. Um, probably running JavaScript. So let's find out. Da, 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 da. All right, here we are. Yeah, so web content, our web rendering process, just totally, totally busy. Uh, and if we open that up with percentages, we can see that uh, memset is very heavy. Actually, the, the um, most self count is in memset, which means that memset is our single heaviest innermost frame. Um, and that's being called from hash table, hash map, uh, declarative environment in JavaScript. So this is, um, looks like setting up function calls. Yep, yep. Uh, so basically, whenever you're calling a function in JavaScript, we have to construct what we call an environment object. And the environment um, contains all of the names that are available inside of a function. So it has all the parameter names and all the local variable names. And that's just sort of our uh, lookup table for uh, local names. And constructing that is apparently very heavy because we make a bunch of hash tables and hash tables call memset a lot. Um, so. There might be some opportunity here to um, to do less of that. 8% of runtime just spent in memset is a lot, I would say. Um, okay, what else is going on? We got property lookup in JavaScript. Um, that's kind of to be expected. Uh, we don't have terribly optimized property lookup, so uh, definitely an area where we could improve, although a bit more architectural. Um, this feels like we could probably find some, some low hanging fruit in the memset area. And then we have painter blit. So that's the canvas, uh, draw image API being called. And then it's told to, um, just draw a bitmap somewhere on the canvas. Makes sense. It's probably just, um, rendering the sprites of the game. Uh, but we do have 4.3% in there. So again, there might be some opportunities, although, I mean, it's it's 2D software blitting, right? There's there's only so much you can optimize that, and um, we're not terrible. There's definitely room for improvement in our blit code, but um, maybe not the place I would start looking for low-hanging fruit. Okay, more JavaScript object property storage stuff. And then another paint call. This one is being called by... Uh, canvas box paint. Okay, so this is drawing the canvas itself into the browser window, basically. Um, three and a half percent. That um, it's not that much, I guess. So again, not sure if there's opportunities there, but um, let's keep an open mind. Okay, and then we have 3.3% in declarative environment has binding. So it's basically a variable lookup in, in JavaScript. So you're trying to access a variable 
we have to look in your environment. Hey, do you have this variable in the environment? Uh, or do we have to check in a containing environment? All right, sure. Uh, more JavaScript properties. And then what's going on here? Internal to integer. Float internal to integer inside draw scale bitmap. Inside canvas box paint. Okay, what's that? That. All right, internal to integer. This is used by. Okay, so it's part of math CPP. Wait, so who's. What are we actually calling then? I guess some rounding function. From draw scale bitmap, round. Um, I wonder if this is bilinear filtering. Okay, so nearest neighbor or bilinear blend. So if we're doing bilinear blend, it would make sense that we would need to do uh, a little bit of floating point math. Otherwise, I wouldn't expect to see floating point math here. Where is this actual implementation? Uh, bum, 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 bum. Or rather, where is the oh, do bilinear blend? OK. So if we're doing that, then that's not bilinear blend. OK. And then if we're doing it, then we do a little bit of math and then interpolate. Okay, and what does interpolate do? Color interpolate does a bunch of round. Okay, so that's presumably where that's coming from. So feels like we're doing a bilinear blend on, um, on painting the canvas, which I don't know that's that what we that's what we want. I don't think so. I mean it's a pixel graphics game, so why would you want Well hello friends. At this point in the video, I make the mistake of opening the playbiolab.com page, which starts to play a bunch of audio, and that audio is all you can hear in my original recording. So uh, now I'm instead going to um commentate what's going on on screen and replace the original audio with that. Yeah, so we're opening the page here in Firefox and verifying that um, they are using an image rendering property called crisp edges. And um, that's why they don't have any smooth blending of the canvas. And I know that we support the image rendering property in our browser, but I don't think the crisp edges value is implemented yet. And um, at this point here, I'm unsure if this is a standard property or if it's some kind of Mozilla specific thing, but it sounds like it's going to be in the standard. So we're just double checking that here. And indeed, it looks like it's one of the allowed values for image rendering. So we just need to implement that. Um, and now we're going to go and look at what type of image rendering properties we support. Because I um, worked on the pixelated value just yesterday, but didn't realize that there were other values that we should be supporting as well. So now what we're going to do is we're just going to add those properties as well. Um, and the auto mode is UA dependent, which means that the browser can decide itself what it wants to do if the mode is auto. But what we do is we do bilinear blending, which works really nicely for many things like photographs and such. But obviously, for pixel graphics, it's not ideal. Um, and it's also slower. Um, if, we can, if we can draw with nearest neighbor, 
we're going to get free performance just from that. So obviously we want to have the opportunity and the content here is telling us, please use nearest neighbor. So uh, it's just, just asking us to do something more performant. Obviously we want to honor that request. So now we are adding the um, valid property values to our CSS properties.json, which is where we just put all of the, um, the possible values for a CSS property. And then we also need to add the identifier to the um, identifiers.json. This is used by the CSS parser to um, recognize valid CSS identifiers, basically. And here I'm just making sure to add them uh, in the alphabetical order, which is very, very important. <laughs> All right, just pixelated and crisp edges. And of course, we already had pixelated. That was one of the two things we supported already. One of the nice things about implementing these types of things is that I actually learn a lot of CSS properties that I didn't know about before just from implementing them. And it's kind of fun. Yeah, so this is style properties image rendering, which is where CSS value identifiers are turned into the internal enum. So we get from the parser, we get a value ID, which can be, um, it's an enum with many possible values, right? But we wanna turn it into a CSS image rendering enum, which can only be one of the valid image rendering values. And this is just a simple conversion between two enums. And uh, at first here, I was thinking that uh, we could map everything to pixelated, but um, then I thought that that wouldn't be such a good idea. It's better to represent the values uh, accurately and then make the decision about scaling mode uh, deeper into the engine instead. What are we going to do with these values? I guess wherever we were handling this currently, this is handled by image box. This is for painting images. And it's also handled by canvas box. Um, but it only checks for pixelated. Because, uh, yeah, when I added this code, I had only ever seen pixelated. So I didn't uh, think to add any of the other modes. Um, so I guess what we'll do is um, maybe we will, we can have a helper function maybe that, or mm, scaling mode to uh, scaling mode. Yeah, let's do something like this. And then we can put this in a single place. Um, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to add a function to graphics scaling mode. Image rendering. Okay, and then if, oh no, let's just switch on it. And let's grab all those values. Also, why are they not in order here now that <laughs> I just want to make sure that they're in order everywhere suddenly? Uh, it's weirdly satisfying. Okay, so wait, is that going to bite me in the butt now that I want it to um, fall through eventually? <laughs> so I guess auto, high quality, and smooth. 
they can be um, graphics, painter, scaling mode, bilinear blend, and then the others will be nearest neighbor. So crisp edges and pixelated will be nearest neighbor. That's pretty cool. All right. And then, well, it's almost like we can just put this here. It doesn't need to be, um, we don't need to put that in a local. Although I do want to put it outside somewhere. So I guess we can put it with, what do we put that actually? Maybe together with, um, there isn't an obvious place to put this, so I'm going to put it together with image rendering. It feels a bit awkward, but let's just do it anyway. Um, what am I trying to do? Yeah, that's probably not the best place to put that, but um, let's just live with it for now. Fix me. Um, find a better place for this helper. Yeah. Okay. Smooth. Okay, so now we're getting some of those uh, uh, enum value not handled in switch in resolved style declaration. Image rendering. So we have to. This is just a function that sort of takes the internal enum of the engine and turns it back into a CSS identifier. So we will just teach it how to do that. Oops. Okay. That should probably be inline and not static. Right, and now we can also use this from image box. So gets rid of a fix me and gets rid of this extra line of code here to graphics scaling mode. There we go. So Let's see if that works, but I feel like that's definitely definitely useful to not do bilinear filtering if we can avoid it. Like if the content is asking us to not smooth out when scaling a canvas, we definitely shouldn't smooth it out. Um, oh, I guess I have to put one of these verify not reached here. Uh, if we look at this thing, actually, I wonder why it needs to specify that, because if we were rendering at one-to-one -one scale, it wouldn't be an issue in the first place, right? So, uh, but I guess maybe we're not, because if you look here, you see the canvas uh, width attribute says 720, height 480. So that's um, the intrinsic size of the canvas. And then the CSS specifies 480 by 320. So it seems like it's actually rendering the game at 720 by 480 and then rescaling it with CSS to a smaller size. Um, so the game's native size is this, actually, which, and now I've done it again. Um, the game sound is once again overpowering the original recording. So here I am just trying out the game in native resolution in Firefox and commenting on how it looks pretty cool and wondering why, why the author of the game downscaled it in CSS. Um, maybe, maybe the screens were smaller when it came out. So we just have to make sure that we don't unnecessarily um, smooth out the downscaled thing because that's costing us performance. 
So, can we turn this into a commit already, I wonder? Crisp edges, high quality and smooth. Yeah. I think these are pretty straightforward. Yeah, so I'm just gonna say libweb. Support more CSS image rendering values. Uh, let's patch adds support for uh, crisp edges, high quality and smooth, or the CSS image rendering um, property. Crisp edges maps to nearest neighbor scaling for canvas and IMG elements while high quality and smooth uh, both used by a linear blending. All right, but does it actually work? That's the real question. So how do we find that out? I guess first thing we want to know is, does the computed um, style actually even show up? Um, also, it didn't even load. That's, a, that's an issue. Oh, okay, now we're loading. And I actually have a local uh, copy of the game that I made. So I'm going to switch to using that instead of uh, the live version, just because we're going to keep reloading it over and over. So um, should be a little faster. Okay, so here's our canvas. And what's the image? Rendering is crisp edges, as you can see right here. Computed style has image rendering crisp edges looking good. All right. And anecdotally, at least, it looks crisp to me, but let's verify that um, those profile frames in bilinear blending have disappeared. So. Just a quick check that we don't have the, whatever it was called, float to integer, or I already forget what it was called. Um, integer to, uh, what was it called? It was in math CPP. Internal to integer. Yeah. So internal to integer is nowhere to be seen. Yeah, which makes sense, because now we're doing uh, nearest neighbor, which is less work. Split with opacity. And where do we actually blit the canvas? Um, I'm not even seeing it. Hmm. Yeah, that's probably a good thing. Anyway, so uh, let's see. What do we want to look at next? I guess one thing that's kind of interesting is obviously we have a lot of JavaScript execution. So I was thinking, what if we um, let me load my local copy, actually. It's just running on my host machine right here. Okay, so I was thinking, what if we scroll this out of view? Because it's supposed to not um, repaint the canvas if it's outside of the view. And if you look at the CPU graph, that seems to work. So at least maybe this could allow us to isolate more of the JavaScript if we bypass the painting. Um, so first we're going to free up profile buffer, then generate a new profile. Um, and then let me close the game. Okay. So what are we doing? 
if we're not having to actually draw the game, then we can see Memset still very heavy, of course, at the top. Um, all those function calls setting up environments. That's good to know about. Malloc coming from the same place, also setting up function environments. Um, property lookups and oh, okay, so here's something new. Um, event loop, wait for event and get next timer expiration. Get next timer expiration. Now that's an example of something that really shouldn't be slow. Um, unless you have just a crazy number of timers. Why, uh, why is that so slow? I've seen that before in profiles, but I never really spent proper time on it. Get next timer expiration, right? So basically, uh, in libcore, our event loop uh, has a number of timers that you can, you can instantiate, and then they will uh, unblock the event loop when they're ready to fire, and then you get a timer event. And that's sort of how all of our uh, timers are built on this mechanism in user space. And I guess it's really simple though. So our timers, it's not in an optimized data structure. We just store them in a hash map from ID to, um, to a timer information object. But still, like iterating through, what are we doing? We're iterating through the timers, checking if uh, they are eligible to fire, and is it time to fire? If so, we're just looking for sort of the, um, the reason that we're looking for the next timer that will fire is because we're trying to figure out how long can we block for in the event loop. Because when the event loop decides to block, um, it will call the kernel and say, wake me up when something happens. Uh, and then we use the, the next to fire timer to tell the kernel like how soon, how soon it has to wake us up even if nothing happened, because that's when our timer is going to fire. Um, but how many timers do we have that we're spending three and a half percent of CPU time in this function? That is uh, really suspicious. So I would like to see these timers. Um, and this is uh, this code runs in every user space program, basically. So we're going to do a little hack here, I think, to only show it for the web content process. Um, maybe something like this. Let's see, this is going to be a bit ugly. So um, if process name is null, then I don't know, something. Okay, and then we can do something here like if process name contains web content, then what are we going to print? We're going to print out, um, I guess, get next timer expiration and um, how many timers we have how many timers we have to look at because this should, unless we're leaking timers or something, I, I would expect this to be over in um, like a microsecond, basically. Um, so let's see, can we get some of that logging? Three. Yeah, I mean, that's not a crazy number. Three or four seems like we're oscillating a little bit, but iterating over three or four timers, why is that taking 3% of runtime? That's really weird. Um, I wonder if it's our hash map that's really expensive to iterate over how do we iterate a hash map begin calls table begin which returns it's not ordered so it gives you a 
iterator that points at the first in use bucket, sure. And then the iterator is a hash table iterator, which is just a pointer to a bucket. And then the way you uh, iterate forward is you skip to the next bucket. So you're just essentially like, you find the first, uh, when you call hash map begin, you get a pointer to the very first in use bucket basically. And then you just advance uh, step by step through the list of buckets from that point, uh, stopping at any used bucket, skipping over everything that's not used. And that means that, um, that you'll, you'll have to, starting from the, the first used buckets, you'll have to visit every bucket from then on, right? You're not like, uh, only visiting the used buckets, you're you're cycling through like all the all the buckets, um, excluding whatever you were able to jump over looking for the first and used one. So it's potentially like you're visiting more memory, I guess, compared to a vector. But even like the overhead of a hash map shouldn't be that much. Like they're a little bit, we put a little bit more padding in them than you would a vector. Like you have to have. I think we have like double the capacity um, of the, the number of entries or something like that. But why is this taking so long? This is, <laughs> this is really weird. I've seen this before in profiles and I just kept thinking, oh, you know, we should just have a better data structure than a hash map and I'll just postpone it and, and deal with it in the future. Um, and, you know, you could put a, a better thing here, like a priority queue, like a min heap or something like that. But... I just find this intriguing. Like, why is this thing? Why is there so much of it? I mean, if you look at these here, it is calling it many, many times. Um, the timestamp is the same, although this is a, um, what's it called? Course monotonic timestamp. So it's not uh, updating constantly. So like, it's not telling the, entirely the whole story, but still, there are a lot of calls, but not that many calls. Okay, let's do a quick experiment. What if this thing would just be a vector instead? Like, what would happen? Um, let's just do a quick and dirty hack, turning this into a vector, because I want to find out, is this slow just because it's a hash map? And if so, then we can investigate why. Um, okay, so now that it's a vector, we can just vary it like that, and okay, and then set becomes append, I guess, and there we go, and then the way that we find to unregister a timer um, I guess just becomes uh, remove first matching with the um, timer ID. So return timer ID is timer timer ID, something like that. Okay. And Wait, get next timer expiration. So let's just not log that thing. Um, oh, that's a pointer. Okay. Let's get a profile. Just a little bit. Good enough. Shut it down. Take a look. All right. So, what do we have now? Um Wait, where is what was it called? Get 
next timer expiration. So um, core event loop get aha. Okay, so now it's down to 0.05% of runtime. Um, so there's something deeply wrong about using a hash map here. Even though we only have three entries, switching to a vector makes it just m ridiculously much faster. It just melts off, basically. So what the heck? Um, I guess we could just switch it to a vector, but um, since we're here anyway, <laughs> I would like to understand what's going on, because this isn't right. Um, so let's look at what the um, hash table iterator actually does. So when you call begin, we walk. First, we have to we walk the entire capacity looking for a used bucket. OK, so actually, before we start doing this, let me just explain quickly how uh, our hash tables are laid out in memory. So um, basically, when you want a hash table, uh, we allocate a single contiguous array of buckets, we call them. So you have like buckets, and then there's like a whole bunch of them. Um, say that maybe we start out with, I don't remember exactly the numbers of how many you have, but say that you have this many for an empty table. And then when you want to insert something into the hash table, um, we look for an appropriate bucket by uh, actually, let me say, the number of buckets that we have, this is the capacity. Um, that's what we call the capacity of the hash table. And um, when you want to insert something into the hash table, we um, run our hash function on the key that you're trying to insert. Also, why did I make so many inconsistent spaces? I don't know. Um, we hash the thing that you're trying to insert, we get a hash um, code or whatever, we get a hash for it, and then what we do is we um, take the hash modulo the capacity so that we get a number from zero to capacity, and that is where we try to insert the thing. So each bucket is um, like just for um, for illustration's sake, a bucket is hash table t has, um, this is pseudocode obviously, but bear with me, um, value, and then it also has some state like, is this bucket in use? Is this bucket a deleted bucket? And maybe that's all the state, actually, I don't recall. We'll find out. But, um, but basically, every bucket has a slot for a value. And it's not, uh, it's not default constructed. It, this is just for the pseudocode. Um, if the bucket is not in use, then this is just dormant, unused memory here that has enough space to instantiate a T. Um, but um, we want to add something to the hash table. So we hash the thing, and then we find an appropriate bucket. Want to add. Um, or insert into hash table. Um, bucket is hash of key. And then um, modulo capacity. And then the thing is that um, there is such a thing as hash collisions, right? And it's made worse by the fact that we don't have infinite capacity. So um, you can have two things, two keys that hash to the same hash. And you can also have um, two different hashes. But when you do modulo capacity on them, they end up in the same bucket. So uh, we do get uh, the situation where a bucket is taken. So we can't insert into the bucket that we want. and. Um, what we do then is that we do this thing we call double hashing, where we just um, take the hash and then hash it again. Um, so we, we hash the hash that you just um, produced here and create a second hash, which we again do modulo capacity. 
um, may need to double hash, hash. Um, and eventually, if we do this enough times, we know that we will eventually find a bucket that is available, so not used. Uh, and that is sort of how that works. And uh, we know that we will find a bucket because we keep track of how much, how many buckets are actually occupied. And um, when we go over some threshold, then we double the size of the hash table. So there's always unused capacity in our hash tables. That is what makes this whole thing work. Like you're guaranteed, if you keep double hashing, you're guaranteed to eventually find a bucket. Anyway. That's essentially how, how that works. So going back to this, in order to iterate um, through a hash table, so imagine that we have one of these. We want to iterate through it and say that we have, uh, maybe this one is in use right here, and this one is in use right here. Then the way our begin function works, which gives us the starting point for iteration, is uh, it looks for the first used bucket. So it finds this one right here. And then we construct an iterator with a pointer to this bucket. And um, then the iterator stores only that pointer internally, as I recall. We just looked at it a moment ago. Yeah, it just has a pointer to the bucket. And then when you plus plus the iterator, we call skip to next, which uh, advances to the next bucket checks if it's used, if so, return, so aborts the skipping, uh, and now you're here, basically, if, if it had been used, but it will keep going until it gets here. And then now you are at a used bucket, so you return, um, and eventually you get to uh, the end bucket, which is apparently a thing. Um, who sets that? And true, I guess, okay, so the very last bucket has an end marker oh i guess we allocate one extra bucket um to mark the end that's kind of cute that could probably be done in a different way um so because the only the only reason i can see for having an end marker is that uh, it allows the iterator to be a simple pointer but you could also do it so that the iterator keeps track of the end pointer and then you could um, keep iterating as long as you're as long as you're below the end pointer you keep going but anyway that's irrelevant at the moment so that's essentially how that works so we get um until here and then we have apparently a sentinel bucket over here the end bucket um and we stop here so yeah let's put that here as well or no not necessary yeah um so how many steps do we then have to take if we imagine it said we had three entries into our thing and that means that we find the first match and then we have to step through all the remaining stuff so basically all the way up to the capacity of the table so uh, based on that i'm just going to print out the capacity of the table because maybe it's much bigger than I think it is. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, shoot. Also, uh, now I have to, um, I have to undo my vector port here because I don't want to use a vector. I, I want to use, um, I don't know. I, I, I want to use a hash table. Uh, it feels like a reasonable data structure here. It's just something is not right with it. So um, now we're going to print out the size and capacity of that thing. And maybe it will turn out that it's actually like a kilobyte or something, or like a, a larger than expected, right? And then um, we can figure something out about that. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, so it's definitely larger than I expected, and in fact, it's growing. Despite the um, size not really changing. That's not good. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, so it seems like we're doubling the capacity every now and then, despite, um, despite the size not really changing. Okay, now it's stuck here for a while. So did you find like a happy place where you want to stay? No? Okay, so it still increases. I guess, oh, I guess it just takes time to fill up. So that definitely explains why it takes a long time to uh, iterate the hash table if it's actually huge. And um, because of the way our hash table iterator works, like we, we have to walk much of this capacity every time. Hmm. So why on earth is this happening then? Is the next question. So um, I mean, I guess we're just the reason that we grow the hash table capacity is because we can't we're concerned that we're not going to be able to fit more things in it because of the thing I talked about earlier, where like if if it starts to fill up, if it's half full, then we're supposed to double it in size so that uh, we can keep uh, providing empty buckets uh, without having to like rehash or double hash too many times. Um, but but something is not ready here clearly, so. Um, I guess I would like to find out why are we doing this? So in hash map or hash table rather, uh, by the way, our hash map class is just um, sort of a wrapper on top of hash table that gives you a key value pair interface, but it's, it's really just a wrapper around hash table. Hash table is the workhorse class of our um, hash data structure implementation. So where do we grow this thing? Grow, should grow. Okay, if should grow, then try to rehash with double capacity. So very, very expressively written here by somebody. Uh, good job, whoever you are. Uh, and uh, let's see what should grow does. Should grow checks if the used bucket count plus one um, presumably that's plus one for the end sentinel bucket uh, times 100 is greater than capacity times load factor in percent. Um, okay, so it's checking, it's dodging having to do floating point math here, and then we're checking if we are uh, using more than 60% of uh, the capacity for used buckets. And used buckets are um, size plus deleted count. Size plus deleted count. Oh. Oh, no, wait. Um, hmm. Okay, so I think I have a clue of what's happening here. So when we delete something from a hash table, um, say that so you know how we talked about this thing where if you get a collision where you want you want to put two keys into the same bucket um, then obviously you can't so you double hash the hash and then you put something in the next bucket instead and what that does is ends up creating these hash chains where um, maybe you have object number one here that you inserted and then you wanted to insert something in the same location, but it was already busy or used, so you had to put it somewhere else, and you ended up putting it, say, not there, but maybe here. And then maybe you have a third one over here. And they all wanted to go in here, but they couldn't because it was taken, right? Um, so because of this, uh, we have this problem when you try to delete something. So what happens, imagine that you want to look up this object right here. Um, then when you do a lookup, you just go through the, the same thing uh, you do as when you're inserting, where you hash the key, and then you go looking here. And you first you look here, because this is where you, you end up. Uh, but you discover that while the hash, um, while the bucket number matches, it's not uh, um, the equality comparison fails. Because 
that's how we know that we found the right thing, that we use the hash to find the bucket, and then we do an equality test on the key to see that this is actually the thing that we're looking for. So the equality test for the key will fail here. So we'll re uh, double hash, go over here, and a quality test will fail again, and we'll double hash and go over here, and now the equality test will succeed. Uh, so you effectively have a chain that goes hmm, hmm, hmm. Now imagine if you were to delete this entry right here. So you just delete that. Um, now, if you wanted to find this guy, then uh, you would first end up here, and then it would point over here where we used to have it was that one, right? No, it was this one. <laughs> uh, it would point over here where we used to have the number two thing. But now because that is um, not used anymore, we get the impression that um, this key is not in the table, but it actually is. It's just needing one more double hash to take us over here. So we can't just delete things from the hash table uh, because we would break these chains. So the way we uh, solve that is that we keep track of deleted buckets. And uh, what that means is that uh, when you delete this guy here, it's not actually fully deleted like this, but rather it gets like a little D marker for deleted. And this lets us know that um, when we're looking for this guy uh, and we start here and then go here, then because of the deleted marker, we know that we should keep looking. Uh, rather than just um, stop here and think that, oh, key is not in the table. And the reason that I'm talking about that is because um, the used bucket count is the size plus deleted count. So size is the number of used buckets and deleted count is the number of deleted buckets. So in our case right here with this situation, um, the used bucket count is three. And if this were still in use like that, the use buckets count is still three. Um, which means, as far as I can tell at the moment, um, without digging closer into the code, but I suspect this is what's happening. Um, as you add and delete more things, they end up, you end up with the table looking sort of like this, right? You just get more of these deleted markers because I don't think they go away. Uh, and because of this, you eventually end up um, overloading the load factor. So you get more than 60% used buckets. And we decide, well, we simply have to grow the table. So we end up doubling the capacity. Right. Um, and then the same thing repeats again, because you insert something, you delete something, which it feels like that's what's happening here, right? Like you have three, and then you have four, and then you have three, and then you have four. So like stuff is going in and out of this hash table. And every time that happens, we uh, create another deleted bucket. So that's problematic. Um, what should we do about this? So the first thing that comes to mind is that we need to learn how to reuse deleted buckets. So like if we want to, uh, and this thing right here, try lookup for writing. This is essentially used when you want to insert something into the hash table, uh, or if you want to update an existing entry. And if it doesn't find the, um, the thing that you're trying to insert. So if we don't have the key already, then uh, we will locate an empty bucket and give that to you. We'll return that to you, and then you know that you can write into it, construct a new T in there. But um, it seems like the way this works here, let's see how it works. So we iterate starting at the, um, yeah, this, you can see this thing that I talked about right here. So we're doing hash. Modulo capacity, that's the first bucket that we look in. And if we find one that is used and it has um, equality with the value that we're trying to uh, write, the value that we're doing a lookup for, then we return this bucket. That's the bucket that we were looking for. It's an existing value. Otherwise, 
if we find an unused bucket, um, then if it's the first empty bucket we've seen, then we remember that. And if the bucket is not deleted, then we return the first empty bucket we've seen. Otherwise, we continue this loop by doing a double hash and starting over again. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that uh, we're trying to find some place to store a new entry. And in a situation like this, right, um, if I go like this thing that I described earlier where we had, first we had the two here, but then I went and deleted the two, so we ended up with this situation. What if I want to insert something here again and just reuse this slot? It's kind of stupid because the way it works now is that we'll look for the first thing that's not deleted. So we'll go here, can't insert here, double hash, go here, can't insert here because it's uh, deleted. Uh, double hash, go here, can't insert, and then double hash again, maybe go over here and put the two here this time. And so we are accumulating entries. Um, we should definitely learn how to put it here instead. So I think um, in order to do that, let's see. So then we should not remember, not just remember the first empty bucket, um, but maybe the first deleted bucket as well. And let's prefer reusing a deleted bucket if possible. So um, if bucket, uh, let's say if bucket deleted and I don't have a first deleted bucket, um, then first deleted bucket is uh, bucket. Okay, so we'll remember which is the first deleted one we've seen in the chain. And then here, we find a bucket that's not used. Um, let's see, if we find one that's not used, but if it is deleted, Oh yeah, we have to be careful now so that we don't, we have to, we have to still um, search through the whole chain, right? So just because we encounter this, so say that we go from here, start, we start looking here, then we go here, then we go here, but we can't stop here before going here in case the, th the three is what we're looking for. So we have to complete the scan of the entire chain, but when we get to the end, we get to the end because we are here. We've reached an unused, undeleted bucket or not deleted bucket. So that is where we're able to return. But instead of returning the first empty bucket, I think we can return the first deleted bucket if we have one. Otherwise, the first empty bucket. I think. I think that should work. Let's see if that passes test. Um, okay, so it passes the hash table tests and the hash map tests. Maybe I can make um, a big command like this. Test hash table. Okay, so everything passed. That's good. Mm. Okay, so if I try to rebuild, it's gonna be a nightmare. Um, you know what, I'm gonna make a little test case for this. So t um, test hash table, I guess. And we'll call it something like, um, capacity leak. And what we really want to test is just if I, if I add and remove like 10,000 things to a hash table, um, did the capacity get totally ballooned or what? Uh, so we'll 
do something like this. And then table set zero, table remove zero. And then expect, I don't know, I guess we can't expect an exact capacity, but we can expect like table capacity to be less than a um, hundred, let's say, because that would be very wasteful otherwise. So let's see how it goes if we try to. Um, that worked. Oh yeah, yeah, right. Because wait, did I fix this particular case now? Because it's the same key every time. I guess because um because of the code I just wrote, I guess this will start working. Um, let's see. What if we didn't have this change here? So what if we just reverted this particular change? still works <laughs> all right all right um okay i'm not exactly sure if i'm thinking about this right but what if instead of using zero every time let's use the i so we're just inserting a whole bunch of different things that will have different hashes okay uh expect this failed so expect not equal we don't have like expect less than um what happens if i just expect it to be an exact number because then it will print out what it is instead um, okay yeah so it failed because capacity is eight kilobytes uh, and I wanted it to be 100. And if I do it 100,000 times, how much bigger does it get? Well, now it's 64 kilobytes. Yeah, okay. So it, there's a serious capacity leak here, and this alone is not enough to fix it, but it is nice that we can just edit, the, um, we can just recompile the test without re rebuilding the whole system. So, um, Let's see if first deleted bucket and uh, first deleted bucket is not first empty bucket. Then I just want to print out uh, reusing deleted bucket. <laughs> I just want to see if that's happening, if I'm thinking about this right. Uh, and I guess I need act format here. No, never got called. Okay. Um, first deleted bucket is null. Hmm. Oh, maybe it's always identical to the first empty bucket. Wait, I'm just going to print everything. Um, first empty. Also, I just realized we can use the um, Elvis operator here. Let's see. Yeah, sometimes there's no deleted one, but it's always identical to the first empty. Hmm. Okay, let's do that. Ooh, look at that. <laughs> Don't get to use this one every day, but it's uh, kind of fun. Hmm. So, but this doesn't solve our problem regardless. This is just um, 
nicety, I guess. The thing that we really want to do is uh, we have to prevent the table from growing infinitely. So I guess the easiest way to do that is to introduce automatic shrinking. So just like we grow the table, uh, what if it would shrink when you remove? Or like, yeah, if we would shrink it down when you remove, then it would, even if you get sort of um, like oscillating capacity or whatever, like sometimes it would go up and down, it would still be better than just growing forever. So I guess after you remove something, after you remove here, you could do something like shrink if needed. Um, wait. Oh, no. But we're returning an iterator. So if I shrink, I will totally screw that iterator that I'm about to return. Okay. Um, but I remember adding this mechanism that returns the iterator and it was only for one reason, because I wanted to use it in, um, I think I was going to use it in remove all matching. Remove all matching. So this function, or rather, actually, let's look at the, yeah, this one right here in hash table. This is an API that takes a uh, predicate callable, and if the predicate returns true for a given entry, it's removed, and it's like done in all in one go. Uh, and we do that safely by like iterating from begin through end, but we, um, when we remove something, we use the fact that remove returns an iterator to next, so that we don't have to call plus plus it on a deleted bucket, which Wait, wouldn't that just work anyway if the bucket is deleted? Because it's still there. It's just deleted. Hmm. I feel like I... This, yeah, this could be done in many different ways, but... Uh, as I recall, this is the only reason that we return the iterator. And now that I look at this... Um... I think an easier way to implement this would be to just walk the entire capacity, walk the entire table, like just walk from here to here, from, from start to finish. And when we encounter anybody matching the predicate, we will just um, delete it. So essentially, plus plus i if uh, let's do something like this auto bucket is m buckets i uh, if predicate or no if bucket is used and predicate or uh, bucket dot slot one more paren then the delete bucket um That's not a thing. What does remove do? Uh, remove just does it manually. Okay, well, let's just put that in a helper. So like this, and like that, and... Void. This needs to be a private API, by the way. Yeah, let's put this down with the private items. Okay. Wait, this is an iterator. I'm not in the right place. Um, yeah, somewhere here, near the bottom. Okay, delete bucket. All right, so we are... Um, let's see. We <laughs> 
we're attacking uh, from many angles right now but so okay so step one is to get rid of we want to stop having to return an iterator from remove so we have to stop using that feature and remove all matching once we no longer return the iterator here we are free to do automatic shrinking in remove so yeah that's the step after this but first instead of implementing it this way so it just needs to return if something was removed so we can keep track of that easily um just like this so something was removed is true and then we also have to remember to um minus minus the size and plus plus the deleted count uh i guess a different way of expressing this would be um removed count and then just say like plus plus remove count and then remove count you could do something like this so like if removed count then m deleted count size minus remove count wow look at that it's kind of tidy okay and then in hash map instead of using this feature here we can oh wait wait why doesn't this just call the table table remove all matching um return predicate for entry key and entry value now i'm confused why this didn't work that way already that's weird and then remove here should not return an iterator either okay yeah all right and then let me just get rid of that for now Let's see if this passes tests and everything something was removed mm -hmm. something was removed yeah okay uh yeah so we're passing everything except the capacity leak test that's a good start or even passing the remove all matching test great 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 okay so um let's do some commits here um let's see remove all matching let's only do remove all matching first of all Wait, did I get the lead bucket? Yes, I got it. Okay. Yeah, keep coming. Um, simplify. Hash table remove all matching. Instead of uh, using relying, all right. Let's see. Uh. This just walk the table start to finish the leading buckets as we go. Um, this removes the need for remove to return an iterator, which is preventing me from implementing auto shrinking. Hash table auto shrinking yes okay 
Also, I have a bunch of unrelated formatting changes that I'm just going to uh, get rid of right now. Hmm. I guess I should have taken that delete bucket change, merged it in as well. Yeah, this one, making use of delete bucket. Let's just bring that into the previous one. Since it's just factoring out this uh, tiny bit of common logic. Okay, now let's remove the return value from remove. Um, wait, did I already put that into remove? Oh, no, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. Okay, so it's coming now. Remove no longer needs to return an iterator, which is fantastic. Wait, 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 hold on. I'm just realizing something. I'm breaking... Am I breaking something here? For ordered tables, this needs to be part of the lead bucket. Updating that stuff. Yeah, yeah, let's not forget about that. Okay, that goes in the previous one, so... Okay, just a little bit of surgery here. Bringing that down there, and amend. Okay. Now we can remove the return type from... Um, remove so we return void and then we don't need the next iterator don't need to return it this is actually really quite nice to simplify that okay remove return value from hash table remove and hash map remove this was only used by Remove all matching uh, where it's no longer needed. Uh, used? Yeah, okay, that fits on one line. Let's go with that. Okay, and now I can do the shrink table, you know, shrink if needed. So, what do we actually want to do here? Void shrink if needed. So I guess we'll shrink. Let's just do something simple. So uh, if the um, size, which is the number of buckets in use here, I don't care about the number of buckets who are deleted, right? Because when we shrink, we're going to rehash everything. So um, shrinking means that that we had this table, but we didn't have many entries. So say that you had only this guy right here. Obviously, you don't need this big of a table to contain only this one guy. So what you could do is you do a shrink where you produce a table that looks like this instead, right? And then you have to find a totally new place to put the one. So maybe it goes here this time. Um, and after a shrink or after a growth, there are no deleted buckets immediately. Like deleted buckets come later on. So uh, immediately after a shrink or a grow, there are no deleted buckets. So what we care about is um, if the size, meaning the number of used buckets, is greater or is, is less than some limit value. Um, let's see. So how about like, if the size times five is less than the capacity. So if you have like less than 20% of the capacity in used buckets, then we shrink. Let's call that should shrink. Um, and this is just a number that I'm pulling out of um, 
my black hole that goes into the universe of numbers. So um, shrink if less than 20% of buckets are used. This number can probably be improved, <laughs> yeah, let's just say. Um, okay, so if, if not should shrink, then return. Okie dokie. So now that we want to shrink, what is the nicest way to do it? I guess, well, actually, let's have a, also a check here. Um, and capacity is greater than what should be our like lowest allowed capacity? I don't know, 16? Let's not shrink below 16. Uh, but never going below 16. These limits can probably be improved, yeah. These limits are, um, are totally arbitrary. <laughs> I just invented them um, randomly, so. Uh, but now everybody saw that, <laughs> so we'll, we'll just put this. Um, but I'm, I'm sure that you, we could do some some data gathering and measurements, uh, a little bit of profiling, things like that, find some optimal numbers. But for now, we just need a something. So if we decide that we do want to shrink, then how about the simplest thing would simply be to uh, try to rehash with capacity divided by two. Does that work? It will just set a new capacity, blah, 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 blah. Seems fine. Yeah, so we'll divide it by two then. Because we're using less than, let's see. Yeah, I guess, I guess the worst case, the worst thing that could happen is that you um, you suddenly n delete everything and then you take multiple steps to reduce the capacity. Another option would be to do like size times two or something like that. Um, I guess that could work as well. Maybe that's the easier option. Size times two. I don't know. There's also one of those things where <laughs> I'm not sure what the right answer is. Also, by the way, this API is fallible. Um, so it will allocate a new table. Um, when you call it try rehash, it will basically, you're here, and then it will allocate this guy and then start transferring everything over one by one from the old table. But if that were to fail because we don't have memory, then that would be okay, right? Like then we just simply, um, if we don't have enough memory to do a rehash, then let's just live with our slightly oversized table. Um, we ignore um, memory occasion failure here since uh, we can continue just fine with an oversized table. Yeah, that's, that's by no means fatal, right? Um, unlike many other memory allocation problems, like just because you have too much space in your hash table, it doesn't mean that you would die. Okay, so what happens now to our test? Well, now we only have eight capacity on the left hand side. Um, shrink. Let's see, yeah, so that's an, so it's size times two. Um, and then it goes down to eight capacity on the left side. Yeah, I guess we shrink from wherever and we shrink down to eight, but that actually at least solves that one particular pathology of like inserting and removing keys over and over. Um, let's see. 
I'm curious what would happen if instead of doing this pattern, what if we just did like um uh or no, like this is good enough actually, but let's take that down a bit and then let's just verify that it's less than uh, 100. Yeah, that, cuz that's that's really what the test is about in spirit. Okay. And then Um, I guess we can test this out with, with the whole system now. It's going to take a moment to rebuild, but I feel like that could be cool. Wow, I got really, really, um, in the weeds here with hash table. <laughs> far away from our um our web game but i'm really glad that we found this issue because it's obviously not good our hash tables were had like a really bad performance pathology basically so that they would always grow as long every time that you delete something from a hash table you would just curse it to um increase capacity So um, this has um, obviously affected the whole system. So it's a really, really good thing to fix. And that's actually something I love in Serenity is um, I find this hash table problem in the context of like this web game. But fixing this, because hash table is used by everything in the system, now everything benefits from the improvements to hash table, um, which is really sweet, I think. Um, not, not many, not many projects have that great of an impact. Um, that's really something you only get with a standard library, which is exactly what we are working on here. Just our own standard library. Hmm. Oh, wait, no, this is just, um, the logon build. Then we, <laughs> we have to rebuild the entire um serenity os as well like right now we're just building the host tools yeah this is going to take a moment so i guess we can do some commit here so let's see don't need format yes shrink if oh by the way oh, oh, oh i'm forgetting something before i damn it i'm gonna have to rebuild again um i wanted to also do this at the end of remove all matching here um yeah after doing that we can do remove remove count shrink if needed right yes that'll be good that's what we should have done all right let's do a commit and he can work in the background here so don't need that. Yes, shrink if needed. Yes. I'm skipping over that one for now. Shrink if needed. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, automatically shrink hash table. Um, when removing entries. If the uh, utilization of a hash table used um, buckets, M size versus capacity goes below 20%, uh, we'll now shrink table down to size times two. Um, this fixes an issue where tables would grow infinitely um, when uh, adding and 
let's say, inserting and removing keys repeatedly. Um, basically, we would accumulate deleted buckets uh, with nothing um, reclaiming them. Uh, and eventually deciding that we needed to grow the table because we grow if used plus deleted greater than limit. Um, noticed we were, I noticed we were spending, or um, the motivation or the reason I found this, I found this because hash table iteration was taking a suspicious amount of time in core event loop get next timer expiration. As it turns out, or no, just turns out the um, timers um, table, timer table, kept uh, growing in capacity over time, making and since iterating a hash table um, is done by um, no, no, oh no, that's fine, that's fine. And that made iteration slower and slower since hash table iterators work by visiting, visiting every bucket. Visit every bucket, let's say. Yeah, there we go. I guess you could do, there are some like little optimizations you could do to iteration, I guess, for bigger tables. Like you could keep track of how many things you visited with your iterator. And if you visited as many as there are used entries, then you can just stop instead of continuing to the end. Um, but I don't know that that's actually worth adding complexity to the iterator. Anyway, let me also commit this change. So basically what this is, is that um, if we find a deleted bucket, when we're looking for a bucket to write into, we will also um, be willing to write into a Wait. First deleted. Am I am I just misreading this whole thing? It's now now that I read this again, I'm thinking, is this a, just a no op that I added here? First deleted bucket. Um, let's see. If bucket is deleted, then remember it. Sure. Bucket is not used. But I guess when I delete a bucket, the bucket is no longer used, right? Yeah, exactly. So, okay, I'm just, I think this is just a no op. Because the first bucket that we find that's empty means that it's unused, and a, that could be a deleted bucket. So this is just doing nothing. We were already we were already smart enough to reuse deleted buckets. I just imagine that we weren't. Because I didn't read the code properly. I was just um I think I had like a mental model of how this worked and then I thought like this feature was not implemented, but now that I think about it again, it seems like it is, right? Hmm. The bucket is not used. It might be deleted. So the first empty bucket can be deleted. 
Yes. That already worked. I was just being silly, thinking that that didn't work. Okay, well, we didn't commit it, but now I'm not going to restart the build just to remove that piece of code, since we only have a thousand more files to compile. And I don't think this will slow down the code so much, because I just want to see that it works with the event loop stuff, and also, I guess, see that it uh, actually improves something. But based on the output that we were seeing here, like with the capacity being 10,922, this means that we had to visit like this many buckets every time that we iterated in that loop. So that was definitely not, that's definitely uh, not helpful. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't just um, change it to a vector and be done with it because that was tempting, but I thought like, let's just dig in. <laughs> Um, now I've, I'm almost forgotten what I was doing originally, but we were doing the, um, the web game. So if this works out, then, um, that'll be a nice little improvement. So then we'll have the crisp edges and a hash table fix. And there's definitely a lot more work to do if we want to improve rendering performance and so on. But I think it's gonna be um, step by step, right? I don't, I don't think that there's like a one big change that will make everything go fast. It's just gonna be um, like 50 small changes, I think. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's something really stupid going on. And if we just stop doing it, then <laughs> it'll get much, much better. Okay, here we are. So install. Okay, moment of truth. Well, it runs the system. So everybody's running that hash table code right now. Nobody is dying. That's a good sign. And yeah, you see capacity oscillates a little bit, but uh, it doesn't like go spiral out of control at least. And we could probably come up with some way to prevent it from oscillating also, but um, my priority right now is just to stop it from, from like getting huge, right? So let's get rid of that printing because um, I want to reprofile just to verify that get next timer expiration is totally gone with these changes. Or, well, not totally, but that it's not 3% or more of the profile. Mm hmm. Okay. Our game is. Looking all right. Anecdotally, it feels a little bit better, actually. I feel like those particles, we didn't choke as much on the particles, but what do I know? Anyway, let's uh, see if we can grab one of these things. Of course, now we have a little bit of other stuff going on on screen as well, but um, maybe it's not the end of the world. We should still be able to see it if it's there. So, okay, that, that, and here we are. Okay, so core event loop get 0.06%. Now that's what I like to see. Uh, seems like we have solved this problem. Fantastic. Very, very pleased with that. And I um, think I'm going to leave these things for the next time, maybe. Um, definitely more to do, but we got some good stuff done. So we've implemented the ad some additional CSS image rendering properties, and we fixed hash table to not grow every 
uh, not grow infinitely if you keep adding and removing stuff. So great progress, I would say. Uh, let's also commit that little test that we made. Um, ack, let's say, or tests. Wait, does this go in tests or ack? What's the category? Ack, 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 test. Okay, I'm gonna put ack. Add a hash table test. Add a test to check um, for um, unbounded hash table capacity leak. We had a bug where hash table capacity would only uh, would increase um, would increase uh, over time effectively, um, which yeah. Um, I mean, actually, that was explained in the previous commit, right? Yeah, that was. So that's just for the... Yeah, the previous previous commit explains it. That's just a test for that. Good thing to have. Okay, so I think that's going to be it for today's video. So if you made it this far, then I thank you for watching and for hanging out. I hope that you saw something interesting today, and I certainly enjoy this type of thing um, and it was nice to do something other than discord for once even though we're gonna get back to that type of stuff too obviously but uh, i really enjoy working on uh, performance analysis and optimization and stuff like that and oh now we had a problem here it doesn't show dns errors in the browser and that's an issue we should probably look into at some point Oh, wait, am I not online? Okay, well, can I just use my local copy? See, that's why it's good to have a local copy. If you lose your um, Wi-Fi or whatever, then it's still good. Yeah, so end of the video. Hope you liked it. Thank you for watching, and see you all next time.